Okay, we're very fortunate to have Professor Rob Larson speak to us about economics. He's an economics teacher. He's recently written a book called Bleakonomics. So he's going to address us on the subject of economics and Bleakonomics in the environment. Rob Larson. Speak loud, Rob. you got to talk over rush hour. I understand. How you doing? Great. Great. I feel like the Pope with this. <laughs> Pretty awesome. Uh, good to meet y'all. How you doing? Great. Uh, my name's Rob. I'm an economist. Please don't hold that against me, though. I'm a nice guy. Uh, so I just wanted to talk a little bit uh, about uh, what my people have done to you all. So, if you ask conservative people or often just the person yeah. on the street why we have the economic system we have, they'll tell you things that they hear from economists at some level, They're mostly involving how great uh, markets are and things like that. It's important to realize, you know, this stuff all flows from economists. First thing to kind of think of is we like to think of ourselves as being scientists, right? So we use a lot of scientific looking graphs and scientific terms. But kind of think back, about five years ago, we had the giant crisis that kicked off the nightmare we're in, right? Well, very few economists saw that coming. Like a small number of people, some of them in the business world, some of them radicals, you know, uh, we're talking about this in advance, but not a lot of them. And it's worth asking, you know, why wasn't economics on top of this thing? <laughs> if we don't have, if we have a job, it must be seeing disasters when they're coming, right? Now, everyone likes to dump on the weatherman for getting the forecast wrong, right? But even economists can see a hurricane coming. And like a couple days away, and some lives are saved, that's positive. It kind of feels like my people can't rise to the level of the weatherman. And that kind of hurts my feelings, you know, a little bit. So, what I kind of want to talk about now, just a little bit, is uh, why that is. Like, why are all my people kind of asleep at the switch? You know what I'm saying? And there are a couple reasons for it. I mean, one is, you know, we don't have the standards that physics can have. You know, we aren't dealing with controlled lab conditions that you'd be real confident about what you're saying. It's a social science. People are unpredictable. Human institutions are real complex. Okay, so that's fair is fair. We do have a harder kind of subject to deal with. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, economics is kind of a politicized science. That's what Ed Herman, the left economist, uh, said a while ago. So. What he meant is, you know, if you're studying geology or something, there's no big institution with money that really cares if the layer of shale is on top of the layer of igneous rock or whatever. You could just say it and no one's going to come after you. In economics, all we talk about are money and power and human institutions. So people with money and power and who run institutions are really, really interested in what economists have to say. And if you take a look at where the money comes from that funds economics departments, I mean, it varies, but it's always a fair amount of private money in there. Business school money, patron money, money from rich alumni who could put a couple hundred grand into endowing a fancy chair or something like that, you know. And if you consider where that money's coming from, the stuff that economists say, it's basically what you'd expect them to say. It's the sort of stuff that's appreciated by the people who can bring the money and the institutional support to create uh, an economics department or give an economist a position. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So that's sort of the basis of it. And where it leaves us though, and including us tiny number of economists who are critical of all this stuff even before the wheels came off. And bear in mind, most economists are sticking by their guns and saying the exact same things they were saying five years ago. If this was astronomy or something, there'd been an eclipse no one expected. Astronomers would, would change what they think. Like they would have to react to it. Economics, we just kind of continue with the same phrases that we did before. Not a lot of change. Use your money in stocks. It'll bounce back. It'll always come back. Privatize Social Security. You know, if we'd done that 10 years ago, it would be gone now. Yeah. So it had been wiped out in the crash of 2007 and 8, right? But that doesn't stop uh, them saying the same stuff now, exactly. So we got now is kind of your three classic big problems, and most of y'all already have you know, awareness of these things, right? So one big one that you want to bear in mind. Sorry, my, no my notepad's soaking up. Is uh, right now we're really starting to see the, co the early stages of the big collision between our economic system and its demands for 
perpetual growth in every way on the one hand, and our natural systems you know, of the planet on the other, which are finite, and which can support a certain level of human civilization, and then we start to exhaust the systems. And they don't just shut off. You know, they gradually lose their ability to continue on and gradually decline and deteriorate. And we're seeing that in a lot of ways now. So one way is in the uh, tendency of our you know, capitalist system to uh, uh, kind of run the natural systems to extinction. So we'll hunt certain whales or various species of animal until they until we reach the point they can't really maintain their breeding stock. And they're also losing their habitat because of human development. You put enough pressure on a living system, it'll collapse. There are basic objective minimal levels that they have to maintain or the system can't carry on. But we have been crashing systems down for hundreds of years now. And I mean, you know, environmental deterioration is a lot older than capitalism is. Make no mistake about that. Like That's why the Romans went down, ultimately, if you take a look at their economy. It's a similar story to today. But of course, now it's on a way bigger scale. Because not only are we dealing with overconsumption of our, of our uh, natural resources, but the, the uh, waste products, the side products from our economic system are starting to pile up on their own. And there are a lot of ways that that's happening. Of course, the biggest one is with our energy systems byproducts, right? Our climate emissions, which by now are pretty out of control. And it's funny too, uh, in the United States, there in a way is sort of a cult of science and technology. And I come out of the sciences myself, I'm very pro-science, but there's a tendency to think that science is gonna fix all of our problems for us, and that's not really how science works. But it's right now that the scientists themselves are the ones who are pulling out their hair, trying to get people to care about climate change and loss of habitat and biodiversity crashing and everything else, to the point that now uh, paleontologists and biologists are saying that we are becoming the sixth mass extinction of recent uh, geological history. So every several hundred million years we have one of these things, the famous one is the meteor that wiped out the dinosaurs, right? And there are several other ones previously through history. Well, scientists are actually researching this and you can read what they say, and they say we haven't become that yet. But we're about 20% there, is their estimate. So that's not so bad, just one-fifth of the mass extinctions, thumbs up. They're saying that we're pretty close, and if the organisms that are list listed as endangered and critically uh, endangered now go extinct, we'll be about halfway there. So that's fairly menacing. But it's kind of funny, because Americans will count on science to solve our problems that we don't feel like dealing with. Uh, but when the scientists say, well, there are some problems with the economic system and perhaps you should carpool or have a more efficient transit system. Suddenly it's a liberal communist conspiracy by liberal liberals who should be shot or shot into space or whatever. It's a classic American attitude. So there's that issue. I should say we economists treat all those problems as being sort of incidental. So the term for it that we use in economic theory is externalities. So if you know, I buy a nice stereo system from somebody we may make a nice deal, and you're happy with the money that I got from the stereo, and I'm happy with my new sound system. But suppose you're my neighbor, and you never sleep again because I blast Judas Priest all night. And I totally do. Okay. Well, that's an externality. You know, noise pollution, that example. It's a side effect of that transaction. In the transaction, we can be perfectly happy, but I may be taking a big dump on someone off to the side that's not part of that market pricing setup. See what I'm saying? In economics, we treat externalities as if they're small things that happen sometimes and maybe they become important someday, but you know, technology will fix it, no problem. The reality is that externalities by now are totally pervasive and you see them all over the place. Climate change is the biggest single one, but the list of them goes on and on and on. And this is where I've done a lot of my own work personally, it's just trying to develop that missing leg of economics a little bit that would deal with this issue. So there's kind of your first problem that the discipline has. You know, it kind of goes on from there, so just to mention them quickly, because I want to go on for eternity here or anything. But uh, besides that, we need to realize that uh, to the extent that markets operate freely, they usually bring about a fair amount of growing economic inequality. And American capitalism was pretty heavily deregulated in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s taking off all kinds of restraints on different aspects of the economy, but especially on finance. And what we've seen since we've taken steps back towards a more pure market economy is a huge explosion in how much wealth gets concentrated at the very top of the system. And of course, that's what Occupy sort of first cut its teeth talking about, right, was the huge growth of wealth and income inequality in the country. 
and the imagery is always you know 99% and the 1%, but the 1% is not far from the small sector of the economy that's begun to concentrate the huge amount of wealth that our society produces. And that's a big deal, okay, because one, another thing we don't really appreciate in economic theory is that concentrated money is power. Power is something that in general we don't treat too much in economics. If labor unions form, well they've got power and that's a bad thing, so that's negative. But corporations or banks or financial cartels can get as big as they want and it attracts very little attention in economic modeling. So you have a situation where this very small upper crust of the United States holds a huge amount of its wealth. Depending on how you want to chop up the wealth, the numbers vary a little bit, but it's pretty consistent. Uh, what that means is that small number of wealthy households has a lot of power and they have a huge amount of influence over what happens in the world, obviously a huge amount of political power. So I remember just last month, Obama had what they call the so-so fundraising month. I think it was 141 million, if I remember right, in that month. So it's, you know, you figure out it's, uh, you know, 70 million a day or 7 million a day, something like that for that month. Uh, that's, that's pretty hardy, and that's considered like, that's fair. That's not so bad, $7 million, that's okay. It's like $500,000 per hour, I'm awake. Pretty good. Well, that comes from wealth concentration. Okay, that, that's not the money that's coming in from the $200 checks. That's coming from the concentrated wealth and the giant sized novelty checks that you can write if you're a part of the, as we say, the 1%. That's a pretty big deal. And obviously, it's not just the political power, but the information system power, too. Uh, everyone recognizes in this group, I'm sure, that we've got a commercial media system, it runs on money. And their job isn't really to tell you what's going on, right? Remember, the way they make their money is from advertising space or advertising time. So you want to present a picture of the world that your advertisers will like and will also keep people coming back to keep watching. That's how you create a good market. Okay. Well, that power is pretty significant, but it's never, you never ever see it in economic theory. Very, very seldom. There are a few of us who are weirdo exceptions and uh, try to, uh, slightly redress what our discipline is missing. Okay. That's a pretty big deal. And I always thought that that was the big, there are a lot of contributions that Occupy has made, but I think the biggest one is just that they brought that picture, they forced it into the national conscience, consciousness against uh, all the power of money to exclude it and focus people on celebrities being retarded or you know, some sloppy, shallow version of the news, like Romney's more handsome. No, I think Obama's more handsome. Oh, it's a tough call. Yeah, the real issue is that a small number of people have all the money. <laughs> they can decide what happens and decide who's going to enter a political office, of course, too, which sort of Tom undercuts Martin that. Just from Bain alone. Yeah. Like his Bain assets. Yeah. That, 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 that sounds about right. That's, that's, but, that, that, he's still, he's, he speaks so reassuringly. I still like him, you know. I'm kind of a chump yeah. that way. So there's that. But yeah. A, to the extent that you see the very wealthiest households where their income comes from. Sometimes it's from work and from being a wildly overpaid CEO, you do see that. But the majority of the time it's from assets, you know, from investments, from holding wealth that's on a large enough scale that it produces a strong income for people. So if you take a look at that 1%, which you see is by far they own the largest majority of American stock, like corporate stocks and bonds. So they own the large controlling stake of corporate America. That's relevant. But also the financial assets are what they're out of control with. You look at American bonds or corporate bonds or other derivatives and fancier financial assets, the concentration of those is out of control. And guys like Romney are kind of a picture of that. And he may not even quite hit the 1%. He, as, as, as cartoonishly rich as he is, not necessarily in that 1% echelon. It gets pretty, pretty rich up there. But that kind of gets to the last sort of problem we're facing now, that financial aspect of it. So again, in the 80s and 90s, we essentially deregulated large parts of the economy, but it was especially finance. Deregulated how big the banks could get, what kind of interest rates and fee structures they could have, what kind of uh, corporate governance that they would be subject to, and also what kind of financial positions they could take. And we've ended up with a situation where, by now, as we move back towards having pure financial markets, we have a crisis about once every 10 years or so. Something like that. And that's pretty hilarious that my colleagues can't even get a grip on that. Like, it happens every 10 years, and each one's bigger than before. It's not like we only had one chance and kind of missed it. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah, the, the AT&T and Verizon and why, why is that happening? They well, stop that abuse from Ma Bell in the 30s. Sure. A lot of this stuff used to be totally illegal. Yeah, absolutely. The 80s and 90s were the period where most of that stuff was taken down. And that includes stuff like deregulating finance, like I was saying, but also what you're talking about, just the ability of firms to become so big and get such monopoly or semi-monopoly status, yeah. 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 That stuff... And they were supposed to break all that up over Right, well, 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 time was, that stuff, big companies were broken up by the Justice Department and its antitrust division. Some of you all may remember that from high school, right? Antitrust. Company gets big enough to kiss being a monopoly, we break it up into smaller pieces. And yeah, AT&T was broken up into the Bell companies and all that. Uh, that law hasn't so much changed like the deregulation for finance has. There, it's more a matter of making sure the people who run that part of the Justice Department aren't going to pursue anything very enthusiastically. And also just chopping their budget down. So if you take a look at the regulators of the economy who are still around, including the antitrust people, they usually have staffs that are extremely, extremely small, like a couple of dudes for like the whole, for one whole industry in the economy. You know what I'm saying? And that kind of does what you would think. It kind of cuts down their ability to do anything. Plus companies, the more money they have and the more money the 1% has, that gives you a lot more ability to retain attorneys and fight things in court. And that plays a role as well. So they tried to break up Microsoft in the late 90s, early part of this millennium. Came kind of close. Bush came in, changed who was in charge of the Justice Department. Pretty soon the suit was dropped. Kind of gives you a sense of it. So yeah, but that control over finance has been a big deal because what my colleagues will tell you is that if you cut taxes or deregulate finance, this gives companies a lot more money and flexibility to create jobs. Well, I think we can all see the fabulous tsunami of jobs that's been created by the tax cuts that have succeeded in crippling our public finances and making us close schools and lay off teachers, stop maintaining all of our public infrastructure, which falls apart sometimes. That part, that part was very successful. Okay, well, it hasn't really worked out, but what it has done is left the very wealthiest echelon of society with so much money that rather than invest it and create jobs, and that's a slow process, and it's risky, and it tightens up labor markets, which raises the bargaining power of the working class. What we do instead is just invest it in nice speculative fields. So create a housing and create a bubble in internet stock, or create a bubble in real estate, or create a bubble in whatever comes next. Food and energy have been sources of bubble-like activity lately, that may become big. It's just increasingly more and more important areas of our life become these financial playthings. They're nice ways to make unsustainably high returns until everything crashes down like it did five years ago. And then we have to pay taxes for a public bailout that rescues them and keeps the wheels on the system, but doesn't stimulate things in any meaningful way that we would uh, recognize. You know what I mean? So that's kind of where my colleagues have, uh, have left it. And it's worth bearing in mind, too, that this has been going on for 30 years of deregulation, cutting taxes, mostly for rich people, letting big companies crush down whatever labor unions we got. And this is all my colleagues will tell you, and they'll still tell you, that this is going to create this great utopia where we have stronger growth and all these new jobs. Hasn't happened yet. Things have actually just gotten shittier and shittier. That's what we've really been seeing. But it's kind of intense. Like that last crisis we had five years ago, if you count all the lost wealth from the housing market crash, the public, bite, the public uh, bailout we had to do, and uh, all the lost production from the recession that it caused, comes to a price tag in the neighborhood of about six trillion dollars. Which is insane. You gotta realize, last year they had that uh, earthquake in Japan that caused the big tsunami, all the destruction associated with that. That was the most, nat most expensive natural disaster that's ever happened in human history that we know of. Most expensive natural disaster. The cost of that, 250 billion dollars. So just that last crash we had, because of all this deregulation and corporate control, about 24 times the cost of the most disastrous natural catastrophe we ever experienced. Well, that's pretty heinous, and that's mostly my people who are responsible for that. If we weren't out there being the pretty fig leaf of capitalism, telling everyone how great it's gonna be if we take the leash off corporate America and stop taxing rich people, if we weren't there doing that, it's pretty unlikely that Congress would have been able to take the leash off, that the executive would have been able to push for all this, and that corporations would have been able to get away with everything they've been getting away with uh, as the property of the 1% for the last 30 years or so. So uh, some of us are trying to uh, undo that a little bit. Uh, I might as well say I got a book uh, coming out tomorrow, actually, uh, by coincidence, I guess. 
that uh, talks about all this stuff in way more detail than you ever want to look at. But it's pretty short, and you might get a kick out of it, and then you can have a lot more arguments to throw in the face of idiots that you see in the high holidays which are coming up on so, us, right? So I'll uh, call it a day with that, right? Do you have the fig leaf analogy in there? So what's that? Do you have the fig leaf analogy in there? Uh, you know, yeah. To remove the leaf and expose the dicks? To expose the, uh, <laughs> expose the dicks. I'm trying to expose the genitals of capitalism. Might is be what too I've been trying to say. publishing publisher, but... Exactly. I, I wish I thought of that. Next time. You said it. Next Your time. Idea. Next time. Next time.